very welcome to uh, this seminar by Michel Swank, uh, who is a professor of French and Occitan medieval literature at the Collège de France since 1994. And since 2000, he is a member of, and since 2011 also, the eternal secretary of the Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres at the Institut de France. It's very difficult to change from English to French. <laughs> I'll see if I can manage that. After Professor Singh's uh, studies at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris and uh, the Sorbonne, he graduated in classics in 1970, no, 67. And he then became assistant professor first at the Sorbonne Paris uh, four. Um, afterwards professor of the University of Toulouse, Le Mireille, at, uh, finally at the Sorbonne Paris 4, uh, and now we are uh, beginning uh, in the early 90s. Professor Sank has been a visiting professor or guest lecturer at many American, European, and Japanese universities. So we are very happy to have you here in Sweden today and at Stockholm's University. In 2007, uh, he won the Balsam Prize, and he's also now an officer of the Légion de Donneur and Commandeur of the Palme Académique, two very distinguished French orders. He's author of about 25 books and editor of another about 20 books. Uh, on medieval literature, principally religious literature, troubadours poetry, and literary theory. He has also founded the series of pocket books, Lettres Gothiques, uh, which is published uh, at the Livre de Poche Hachette. He is now a director of this collection, uh, which published medieval literary texts in ancient and middle French, with a translation into modern French. And when he is not occupied with these scientific matters, he also writes novels and texts. <laughs> I would like to mention only two books that have been translated to English, because we cannot present all the 45 books he has written. Uh, one of these is uh, the Medieval French Literature um, Introduction, which is a comprehensive introductory manual that critically reviews and reports everything that is currently known uh, about medieval uh, French literature and its development. The original book was intended for first and second year French university students. And the other book is the Encanted, uh, encant the Encantment or the Enchantment? Enchantment. Enchantment, thank you, uh, of the Middle Ages which is, uh, was translated by Jane Marie Todd, and it is a uh, collecting uh, of uh, Professor Sang's inaugural lectures uh, in the College of France and four essays, essays that expand on uh, its themes. Uh, here, Professor Sang explores the changing nature of our understanding of the period and its literature, revisiting questions of what is old and new in medievalism and in medieval culture itself. We're very proud and very happy to have you here today. Very well. Thank, Thank you very much. Oh, maybe it's a little loud, at least in my own ears, but never mind. Thank you very much, dear colleague and respectability. I don't know if you use the expression here for uh, your uh, kind words, and I'm very happy and proud to be here today. I'm to be in such a delightful city, a wonderful university, uh, so clean, uh, so clean. When you come from France, uh, it's so extraordinary to, uh, it's like an oxymoron to have a clean university. Uh. I'm not so proud to have to deliver this lecture in English uh, because my English is very, very poor and my accent very, very bad, as you can already uh, notice it. It's 
a little preposterous too, because almost everybody here uh, knows French perfectly and is fluent in French. But nevertheless, you can take it uh, as an, uh, a show, a circus show, a clown exhibition, so what you want. And uh, uh, so I try. And I'm not so proud uh, either of my title, uh, Sense and Sensuality in Chrétien de Troyes, Eric et Enid. Sense and Sensuality can hardly be a good title because it is a bad joke, of course. Uh, it's uh, pedantic and not so funny after all illusion to Jane Austen's famous novel, uh, Sense and Sensibility. As you know, as everybody knows, in this novel, sense refers to a reasonable Eleanor's good sense and sensibility to romantic Marian's rash infatuation. But every reader of Eric et Nid, Chrétien de Troyes first romance around 1170, Every reader of Eric Enid understands for a start sense as meaning, as meaning the meaning, <laughs> the sense of the romance. However, sense in this romance may also refer to good sense and reason, opposed, still not so much opposed after all, and it is precisely my point, opposed and not so opposed to sensuality. Why sensuality? Just for the sake of making Jane Austen blush? Not at all, not at all. But, uh, but it's too rush. I have to begin uh, with the beginning. It would be a little bit clearer if I do so. My point in this lecture is the following one. First, Eric Enid is clearly a romance about love between husband and wife, even if it is not what we usually expect from courtly love. Love between husband and wife, matrimonial love, uh, such a topic is not so frequent in world literature, and still less so in French literature. There are many novels about adultery, uh, but very few about matrimonial love, actually. Second, according to Chrétien, strong, true, and long-lasting love between husband and wife is based both on sense, reason, and on sensuality, but not on sensibility. No. Such is the sense of the meaning of the romance. But uh, all these considerations uh, are not yet the real beginning. Of course, the real beginning is what is. Eric Enid. Why Eric Enid? And uh, why Chrétien de Troyes? Who is Chrétien de Troyes? Everybody here knows Chrétien de Troyes, but I'm not so sure. You never know uh, when you give a lecture in a foreign place uh, what is expected from you. No. So I beg your pardon, and I'm very sorry if I say very evident uh, things. So. And why uh, does the whole thing matter, my topic? It matters, actually, for our very idea of love and of life, which owes a lot to medieval poetry. Everybody knows that. The first years of the 12th, uh, 12th uh, century witnessed the apparition in southern France of a new poetry, uh, a new conception of love, and a new relation between love and 
poetry. The new poetry uh, was uh, the songs of the Occitan troubadour. The new conception of love uh, wha was what we call courtly love and what the troubadour called fin amour. Pure love, pure meaning, not chaste, but refined, like pure gold is refined uh, through fire. The new relation between poetry and love resided in the fact that for the first time in our civilization, love was the main topic of poetry. The fact that love is the main topic of poetry is evident for us, but it is evident for us thanks to the troubadour. It was not evident uh, at the time. The Greek and Latin poetry, which was the literary model uh, for the Middle Ages, as well as the ancient Germanic poetry, was essentially heroic and uh, mythological. Elegiac and erotic poetry existed, of course, but uh, as a minor genre. This Occitan novelty reaches very soon, as you know, Italy and Catalonia, where poets use Occitan language for their love songs, and northern France, Germany, uh, and particularly French-speaking England, uh, thanks to Alienor of Quitania, the first troubadour's granddaughter and wife of King Henry II and thanks to two of his four sons, Henry the Young, uh, the Young King, and Richard Lionheart. Uh, so uh, thanks to Eleanor and uh, thanks to his sons, uh, this courtly love was very important in uh, uh, French-speaking uh, England. The uh, two princes, uh, Henry the Young King and Richard Lionheart, spent most of their life in southern France. In French-speaking areas, and a few years later, uh, in, uh, in German-speaking areas also, the idol of the fin amour does not only inspire lyric poetry, but also romances. First, like uh, a glaze or a varnish on romances adapted from Latin classical literature. But courtly values and courtly love become the core of a new kind of romances, the Arthurian romances. And the poet who make Arthurian material a literary hit for centuries is Chrétien de Troyes, who is active between uh, 1170 and 1185. Uh, uh, All his five romances are Arthurian romances, but they are also new in other regards. They don't consist in historical or genealogical narratives like their predecessors, like the Historia Regum Britanniae uh, of Geoffrey of Monmouth, like West's uh, trans uh, was translation and adaptation of Geoffrey of Monmouth in the Roman de Brut, like uh, or the other uh, Romans of Brut, um, of Layamont, of other writers. No, uh, Chrétien proceeds quite uh, differently. Uh, his romances don't have the ambition to tell us all about King Arthur's reign. They concentrate on one character's destiny. And uh, Arthur's kingdom is but uh, the background of uh, this destiny. Typically, they relate how a young man, through his adventures as an errant knight, and he's the inventor of this purely literary concept of the errant knight. As an errant knight discovers his vocation, discovers his destiny, discovers sometimes 
his family, uh, discovers always himself and love. All his romances are Bildungsromane. The young hero discovers love. All Christian's romances, but the last one, and still the last one, the Conte du Graal, is also a romance love. All these romances are love romances. Chrétien's patron was Countess Mary of Champagne, the daughter of Aliénor d'Aquitaine, and uh, her first husband, King of France, Louis VII. Countess Mary was a fan of courtly love and of uh, its casuistic. Chrétien emphasizes that she imposed on him the matter of his third romance, Le Chevalier de la Charrette, Lancelot's devotional, absolute love for Queen uh, Guinevere, to the point that he accepts to be dishonored for the sake, uh, for her sake, and eventually the story of the adultery. But uh, Chrétien confesses that he is not, almost confesses that he is not at ease with such a topic, and he never finished uh, this romance. One of his uh, disciples uh, 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 finished it. That is the point. Uh, but uh, uh, so, so is with the uh, Chevalier de la Charrette. But, no, excuse me, the point is that Eric Enid, his first romance, his own romance, nobody asked him to write his first romance. He was not yet known. This first romance is a love romance between husband and wife. Before before we go back to it, allow me to draw attention on one more key feature and a very peculiar one uh, in Christian's romances. In most of them, maybe in all of them, the protagonist meets with an immediate and easy success. After a few hundred lines, the story seems to be coming to its end, but it is just the beginning. The hero loses all that he just won because he does not understand its value. And he has to regain it, to resume his adventures, to do it all again a second time, but this time with difficulty, with pain, with suffering, and with the whole conscience of the price of what he once won and lost. The second part is the main part, the important part of the Romans. The best known example of this structure is, of course, uh, Le Conte du Graal, the story of the Grail uh, that Chrétien is the first uh, to tell. Perceval is a simpleton who doesn't know who is God, what a knight is, who King Arthur is, what love is, who doesn't know how to behave, who doesn't even know his own name. He finds one day the Grail Castle, doesn't understand a thing, doesn't ask the question he should have asked, and will, after that, spend years and years trying desperately to find again the Grail Castle and the Grail. Le Comte du, Grail, du Graal, the Grail's Tale, is Chrétien's last romance. Mutatis mutandis, we find the same narrative outline in his first one, Eric et Enid. Eventually, uh, we go back to. The story is as follows. Eric is a king's son 
and a young knight at King Arthur's Cow Court. After having defended and protected Queen, Queen Guinevere against a rude and impudent dwarf, he is dragged into an adventure that leads him to be the host of a poor knight, to fall in love with his beautiful daughter, daughter Enid, to win her hand by his victory in a tournament. Both, both of them go back to King Arthur's court, where they are heartily welcome. He is a hero of the court. She is uh, the pet of the queen. Uh, the king distinguished her by giving her the kiss of the white stag. I give up explaining everything. Uh, their wedding is celebrated and they go back to Eric's kingdom. Is that the end of the romance? No, it is but the beginning, the first part, the first ver versus, as Chrétien explicitly uh, says it. Their honeymoon is so blissful and so long. Actually, they are so happy and so in love that there is no end to the honeymoon. That Eric gives up his nightly duties, attending tournaments, leading wars, and threatening his vassals. He gives up all that in order to stay with his bride. That sets, uh, that, uh, sets tongues wagging in the country. There is discontent. Enid hears part of it. One morning, after love making in the Middle Ages, they seem to have liked uh, making love in the morning. So it is in the morning. Eric uh, goes back to sleep. Enid looks at him asleep, thinks of the gossip, laments her bad influence on her husband and sheds a teardrop that wakes Eric up. He asks her, of course, what the matter is. She confesses all. He immediately equips himself with full armor, orders his and her horse to be saddled, commands her to put on her most splendid dress and to ride in front of him like a bait, warning her not to dare to speak to him to tell him a single word under any circumstance. The bait is very efficient indeed. All kinds of evildoers attack them. A need riding in front sees them first every time. Every time she disobeys her husband and alerts him. She prefers to be hated that to put him into danger. Every time he pretends to be very angry at her, every time he is very happy indeed. Eventually, after many adventures and perils, when Eric, wounded and exhausted, is unconscious and everybody, any included, thinks he is dead, an abominable lord proposes her. She refuses, of course, but he intends to marry her by force. At this very moment, Eric comes back, hears the ugly proposal, kills the lord, and flees out from the castle on his horse, carrying Enid in his arms under the moonlight. They are reunited and reconciled. After a last and rather mysterious but necessary adventure, and after Eric's father dies, they are crowned in a knot. The general meaning, the sense of the Romans, is clear enough if a few details are not. The sense is as follows. It is easy to fall in love. It is easy to marry. But it is not so easy to understand what we are doing 
by falling in love and marrying. It is not so easy to weigh to the implications of such a commitment. Eric falls in love with a need and marries her easily enough, but without giving a thought to what he's doing and, more important, to what he will do next. He doesn't give a thought to how to conciliate his duty and his pleasure as a husband with his duty as a knight, as a lord, as a king's son, as a future king. All that he has to learn, and first he has to learn that he has to learn it. Because he didn't think of that, he loses what he won. He doesn't lose a need because she is a loving wife, uh, very much in love. But he loses faith in her and in himself. He is at a loss. He sees no alternative between sleeping late after making love to his wife and putting the two of them in danger, transforming her artificially into, into a perpetual damsel in distress and luring all the villains of the country in order to show her what a brave knight at a good spot he is. After this ordeal, after he got the proof that she cares for him, after he gave the proof both that he cares for her and that he is level with his duty, they are more united than during their long honeymoon, and their coronation appear as symmetrical with their wedding. It is like its complement. That is the part of sens. The sense is that marriage is not nonsense and sensuality. All that we have said until now could induce to think that Chrétien doesn't think a lot of sensuality. But it is not true. On the contrary, Chrétien emphasizes the importance of sexual harmony in the couple. He does it two times. The first time, and is the first quotation on the handout, the first time is when he describes Eric and Enid's wedding night. And, uh, uh, you, but it is what you have under your eyes. Uh, you have the uh, old French text, the translation in modern French, and uh, uh, an English uh, uh, translation. Uh, Sorrier la joie et le délit qui fut en la chambre et où les... I allow myself to read in ancient French uh, since you have the translation. So. Ser chassier qui de souhait falène ne désire tant la fontaine, l'esprevier ne vient au reclin si volontiers quand il a faim que plus volontiers n'y venisse un souhait qu'ils s'entretenissent. C'est le nuit en moutre restauré de ce qui l'orne demeuré. Quand vu dit leur fut la chambre, leur droué rende à chacun membre l'œil d'esgardé se refond, s'il qui d'amour l'avoué au fond, et leur message au cœur envoient, car mout leur plaît quand qu'ils voient. Après le message des yeux, vint la douceur qui mout vaut mieux des baisers qui à mort attraînt. Enduit, c'est la douceur et c'est, et leur cœur dedans en abeur bromouèvre, c'est que à poêle ne sont des souèvres. De Béziers fut le premier jeu, et la morse qui hier entre aux deux fit la pucelle plus hardie. De rien ne s'est accoardi, tot s'offrit que que l'y grevaste, un souhait que elle se levaste, au perdu le nom de pucelle, au matin fut dame nouvelle. We see how audaciously Chrétien applies to the desire and to the impatience of the two young people the famous quotation, the famous beginning of the psalm, uh, 
41, ja, kommt man dumm, kehrt des Ideat hat von Tessa Quarum, ich hatte des Ideat an immer mehr als den Deus. It's not Deus, it's the loved one. No. But the following lines are still more interesting. They tell us that everything goes well and that this moment binds forever the just married couple because there is something harmonious in their love making, because they take their time and enjoy every step, because Eric is patient and careful and delicate. Chrétien clearly thinks that all that is so important that it is worth writing 30 lines to tell it. Discreetly, but clearly. Yeah. You may object that uh, everything goes too well, since uh, after that they can't put an end to the honeymoon. Not at all. Eric's patience and carefulness win entirely uh, in its mind and body, if I dare say so. No. The remainder of the romance will give evidence enough for it. For it. It's Eric himself who doesn't know how to conciliate sense and sensuality. The second time when a Chrétien suggests the, this uh, harmony, this sexual harmony uh, between the two protagonists is symmetric with the wedding night uh, as the coronation is symmetric with the wedding. It is after the reconciliation. They share together every trial. Each of them was willing in every crucial instance to sacrifice himself or herself to the other's sake. They escaped together the ultimate peril. Eric's wounds healed, Enid recovered from privation and weariness. Eventually, during the first peaceful night since the beginning of the adventures, they make love again. And it is the second uh, quotation. Oh. Oh. I'm sorry, it's uh, awful. Oh. Non. Or fut Erec, Totsfort et Saint, or fut Gary et repassé, or fut Eni de lit assez, or haute sa jouée et son déduit, ensemble gisent jour et nuit, or haute ses volontés, or y revient sa grande beauté, car au mout estoué et pâle et teinte, si la voix ses grandes œils estinte. Or fut accolé et baisé, or fut de tout bien haïsé, or haute sa jouée et son délit, or son nu à nu en un lit, et il y ince l'autre à col et baise, n'est rien nul qui tant leur plaise, tant ont eu mal et ennui, il pour lui et elle pour lui. Or ont fait leur pénitence, l'un sans contre l'autre tense, comment lui puisse mieux plaisir, d'où sort plus me désir. No. The new perfection of the restored love is mirrored in the new perfection of the lovemaking. The first time during the wedding night, Enid endured patiently, but also easily, easily, thanks to Eric's kindness, what she had to endure. This time, she is active, if I dare say so. This emulation between 
them. They vie in generosity. Each of them wants to give to the other more pleasure since each of them suffered from the other's sake. The discreet and still not so discreet poet adds that he must say nothing about the surplus. Chrétien uses several times this word in his romances as an euphemism for the ultimate deed of love. But he doesn't need to say anything about the surplus. The preliminaries are more important uh, and more meaningful. Despite his affected discretion, he tells everything. The conditions for uh, sensual, both sexual and amorous fulfillment, he insists upon, tell everything of the moral duties, values, and requirement of marriage. That's sensuality uh, sense. And it is in conformity with the teaching of the church. In uh, many uh, treatises of the time, uh, they insist upon uh, this point. And um, for, uh, for instance, uh, in, uh, but uh, I, I will tell that in conclusion. If I tell it now, I have nothing to say at the end. And uh, I say so preposterous. Well, just wait a little. But waiting for that before I, we conclude. Let's go back one more time to pure sense without sensuality. In Eric Enid's prologue, Chrétien writes that I should have written uh, the two lines, but uh, they are very well known, that uh, he traits d'un conte d'aventure une moute belle conjoncture from an uh, adventure, a tale of adventures, he makes a very beautiful conjuncture, conjointure. Uh, the very infrequent word conjointure gave rise to a lot of conjectures. A lot was written on the subject for more than a century and still is. Quite recently, an Italian scholar suggested a rather new and very interesting, if perhaps a little bit too sophisticated to be perfectly true, uh, interpretation. But all, uh, since uh, Jean Frappier, all agree in considering that the conjointure has something to do with the composition of the Romans. Either its organization, its, its structure, or its clever relation to the title, to the conte d'aventure, which is uh, its source. Anyway, the origin of the word is Latin coniungere, to put together under the same Yolk, yogum, French jou, like conjugem, French conjoint, suppose. It's the same etymology. My suggestion is that Chrétien uses this rare word conjointure in order to put up that the meaning, the sense, his romance extracts from the tale, uh, from the Conte d'Aventure, uh, it derives from that uh, the, this meaning is about marriage, about conjugas. He uses this real word uh, conjointure because it is conjungere et conjugem, conjugas. It would be, if I'm right, it would be a joke, of course. Uh, 
But Chrétien likes joking. And he makes another pun, but ten lines further, at the end of his prologues. Désor, comment serait l'estuaire qui tot jos mes hier t'en mémoire, tant qu'on durera chrétien tids, de ce ces chrétiens vantés. In the 12th century, tant qu'on durera chrétien tids, uh, uh, as long as uh, uh, Christendom uh, endures, did mean as long as the world with, with last. Nobody could imagine that the Christian faith could disappear before the end of the world, of course. So it seems like boasting for the poet to say that his romance will last as long as Christendom. But his name, his own name, is Chrétien. So, tant qu'on dura chrétienté, actually means as long as Chrétien's name will last, as long as Chrétien will be remembered. It's actually a modest truism, is a la palissade. <laughs> By the mean of its conjointure, the Romans teaches the conjoint, the spouses. Its conjointure reveals its sense, both its meaning and its good sense. And the sense is that a happy sensuality is both the condition and the reward for commitment uh, in marriage. And so I resume what I was uh, just saying saying a few minutes ago, there is nothing neither surprising nor exceptional in such a view. It is, once more, the very teaching of the Church, as it appears in confessors and books, in predication, in devotional treatises of the 12th and 13th century, like, for instance, La Somme le Roi, it's a treatise from a Dominican, uh, Frère Laurent, uh, which was written at the request of King of France, Philip III, uh, St. Louis son, for uh, his own son, the future uh, uh, Philip the Fair, Philip the F for the Fair. And uh, uh, Frère Laurent uh, said, uh, right somewhere in La Somme le Roi, when uh, you are married, uh, you must be very careful and very attentive to your wife's desire because uh, 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 women are shy and dare not to say uh, when they are longing for love. So uh, you must be attentive and guess. And so, and uh, we find the same idea, but uh, as a joke, and um, sometimes uh, as an, uh, an obscene joke in some fabliaux, but uh, which are nevertheless uh, uh, maybe obscene, but nevertheless true uh, to the teaching of the church. For instance, uh, uh, but I will not tell uh, Fabio, uh, this Fabio. Uh, Chrétien, uh, Chrétien de Troyes, was evidently a cleric, and he is a moralist. We can see that in all uh, uh, his five romances. His position is a position of the church. His originality is not in his attitude towards marriage, not even in his benevolent attention uh, to physical pleasure between husband and wife. His originality resides in the conviction that the virtues produced by courtly love according to the troubadour, 
Sen e mesura, reason and moderation. Praise, moder uh, reputation. Courage, abnegation. All these virtues produced by court love, according to the troubadour, find their accomplishment and their perfection in marriage. And well, that the troubadour would not say at the time. So, thank you. But I uh, really, I am sorry for my English and my accent, uh, my pronunciation. Oui, merci beaucoup. Thank you for this interesting and critical reading of uh, Eric Enid, uh, very interesting romance by Etienne de Troyes. Uh, is there any questions now to Professor Zink? In English or French? Yeah, I think you can do <coughs> English, preferably, English, preferably yes. yes, yes. Thank you very much. It's a very beautiful interpretation of Quan Jean so, uh, Tire. I am so and I'm dead. So, <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, yes, yes. And I was just wondering. I would be very curious to, to uh, you commenting on. Um, um, so you know that several scholars have compared. A need to the lion in the Chevalier Lyon. No. What, what do you think of such a comparison? Uh, um, yes, I, I know that, but I would not uh, actually compare a need to the lion because uh, the question uh, in uh, the Chevalier Lyon is the same as in the Reiki need. Even uh, marries uh, uh, Laudine or uh, Landine without knowing what he does and uh, without thinking about it. She is beautiful, uh, he just killed uh, her husband, why not marry her? And so uh, uh, it's on. Uh, but after that, he realized that uh, uh, he's young and he likes uh, pleasure and uh, court life and uh, to spend his life uh, in this uh, uh, castle, in the woods, and different uh, fountain. Uh, it's not so much fun. And uh, so, uh, of course, during his adventure, the lion is uh, his companion and is uh, helpful, like a need uh, uh, to, uh, to Eric, but uh, it's very disparaging for a need and uh, for the very meaning of the Romans to compare uh, the, uh, the lion and a need. The difference is that uh, Eric Enid, uh, the first Romans, is an optimistic one about love and marriage. And uh, Le Chevalier Lyon is a pessimistic Romans. Uh, because there is no such love uh, between Yvain uh, and uh, Laudine as between uh, um, Eric and Enid. Uh, the situation is so strange. Uh, uh, Yvain is quite so... Um, it's not so... Uh, how to put uh, that in uh, his... Uh, Love and his excitation about uh, uh, Laudine uh, has something unhealthy in itself. Uh, uh, so, considering the situation, and it's the same from uh, Laudine's part. And most of all, uh, in uh, Laudine doesn't seem to uh, love uh, even uh, any longer. At the end of uh, the Romans, they are reconciled, but uh, uh, through a list of lunettes once more. No, no. But uh, she, uh, Laudine, resigns himself in uh, uh, living uh, again with Ivan. It's all. It's, uh, uh, the atmosphere is, uh, is quite different. Yeah. But also... Uh, after 
even uh, though he's mad and uh, so healthy again and so on, but uh, all his adventures uh, has as a uh, goal uh, to conquer uh, Lodin again, but uh, there is no direct relation between these adventures and Lodin. This adventure has nothing to do, actually, uh, with Lodin. So there is no reason why, uh, after all these adventures, he will uh, conquer uh, Lodin again. His, uh, uh, it's like uh, the adventure uh, of the uh, errant knight had lost what, uh, their very meaning. So, it's a, uh, 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 the beginning, beginning is wonderful and, uh, uh, and all the Roman is uh, wonderful in a way, but uh, it's uh, 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 the more, uh, the saddest romance uh, of Chrétien, actually. Thank you. Uh, so I put it so, uh, it's so awkward uh, the way I explain it, but uh, you all understand. Uh, it's so simple what I want to say, that even in my English you can understand it. Thank you. Are there any further questions on this? Uh... Yes, yeah, yes, thank you. I would like to ask, it's a big question, but I would like you to, to reflect on the legacy of Chrétien de Troyes mm -hmm. in, you know, in, in Western civilization, given the fact that Christendom has very much emphasized the place and the function of marriage, mm -hmm. and also Christendom being religion of incarnation, and the problems with sexuality or the ambiguity with sexuality mm -hmm. in, uh, in Christendom. Could you, could you Say yeah. So and I'm also thinking about Denis de Rogemont, l'amour en accident. Oui. For oui. Yeah. So uh, there are two, two things. First, for Chrétien himself, uh, his influence was real and uh, profound, but probably not in this regard. I, I uh, told, uh, I said, uh, and I'm convinced of it, that Chrétien uh, is a moralist. But uh, he probably was not read uh, in this sense. Uh, for instance, uh, the Grail story, uh, since the beginning, since Chrétien, is a Christian story, precisely because the uh, a uh, consecrated host in the Grail. And uh, my opinion is uh, that Chrétien uh, already knew uh, the legend of uh, uh, Joseph or of Arimathy. But uh, uh, after that, uh, there was like a laicization of uh, uh, the story of the Grail. And uh, for instance, in the um, prose uh, Tristan, uh, there is a quest of the Grail, but is just an adventure like uh, uh, every other adventure. It's a nightly adventure, no longer a religious adventure. And uh, uh, the uh, religious or moral meaning of uh, Chrétien's romance uh, rapidly disappeared. And uh, the profane side of uh, cultural love and uh, uh, roman d'aventure et d'amour uh, triumphed. And for uh, uh, concerning uh, uh, Denis de Rougemont, so, uh, oh, no, uh, it's a very, very important and influential book. Uh, it's not entirely uh, uh, a true book. Uh, the, for instance, for Denis de Rougemont, the model of court love uh, is uh, who are uh, Tristan and Isolde. But uh, it's, uh, he's wrong. Uh, for the Middle Ages, uh, le, uh, Tristan and Isolde were not uh, courtly lovers. Many troubadours, and Chrétien himself, in one of his two love songs, uh, many poets 
say, I'm a better lover uh, than Tristan was because uh, Tristan couldn't help uh, loving his, uh, because of the felt, of course. No. And uh, I love my beloved because, uh, uh, because I think uh, rationally, in a way. I, uh, I love her passionately and rationally because she is the uh, uh, most beautiful, the most clever, the most kind, uh, and, uh, uh, and so on. And uh, precisely, uh, Chrétien uh, tried uh, again and again uh, to uh, rewrite uh, Tristan and his story uh, in a moral sense, uh, in the sense of the common uh, moral or Christian moral, but also in the sense of a moral uh, of love. Uh, he says it explicitly uh, in clichés. He resumes the situation of Tristan Iseu, uh, um, Finis and Clichés love each other, uh, Finis is married to uh, the uncle, and uh, what to do uh, next? And uh, he tries to find a satisfying and moral solution. And he fails, uh, actually. Uh, they have to... Um, they flew like, like uh, criminals. And uh, even in Eric Enid, in my first quotation, um, maybe I was wrong, I suppressed a few lines uh, in order not to have too long a uh, quotation. And in these lines, he writes, for this uh, wedding night, uh, Brangien was not substituted uh, to the bride like uh, in the legend of Tristan and Iseu, uh, Iseu is no longer a virgin, so uh, Brangien, uh, her maid, has to sleep the first night, spend the first night with King Mark. Uh, and uh, he's obsessed uh, with uh, um, uh, Tristan's story, uh, but of uh, a uh, uh, bad story of love, a beautiful story, but uh, a bad story. And uh, uh, on this regard, this, they all thought uh, the same. Uh, and uh, uh, by emphasizing uh, the Tristan is a story, uh, Denis uh, de Rougemont has an, an exact uh, point of view, uh, in, my op in my opinion, but uh, on, uh, on this point uh, I'm sure I'm right. I'm not always sure, but uh, yeah, I am. You had a question here. Your name is. Yeah. Um, I had a question yeah. about the wedding night scene in Quebec. Um, in your um, in your experience, the the build up of this scene, the structure, I mean, is it typical by Tatian's time already, or does it become typical after him? Or um, uh, this construction is two parts. Uh, a first success, and he loses everything, and this uh, structure. The, the, no. the, um, I mean, the structure of like emptying the chamber, love enters, enters through the eyes, the heart becomes inflamed, then come kisses, then comes... Ah, yeah, yes, yes, and yes. No, no, so, uh, yes, this description of, uh, of love, of uh, love making, uh, we find, of course, elsewhere, uh, uh, other in, uh, in Chrétien's romances, or uh, in, uh, in these lines. But... Uh, uh, what is particular uh, in, uh, in Christian uh, Christian romance first that uh, they are just uh, just married it, uh, they are husband and wife and usually uh, they are not at all married uh, the lovers in the, this uh, uh, situation and uh, uh, second in he insists particularly uh, on uh, uh, the uh, uh, the carefulness uh, the uh, point that uh, uh, Eric of course desires very much uh, his, his young bride but he takes the time uh, not to be brutal and so on and uh, it's some, uh, something very uh, precise 
in a way very indiscreet, but he say he tells it uh, very discreetly, and uh, it's uh, visibly important uh, to him, and uh, that is not so uh, so frequent. You you found the succession felt uh, the eyes, and uh, after that the hands and the kisses, and uh, of course, uh, but. Uh, uh, this particular point, in my knowledge, it's just Chrétien. Are there any further questions on this reading? No? Uh, then I would thank you once more. And I, I think we should say that this may be your last uh, conference in, for Collège de France. Yes, you know, in a way. Uh, to say the, the truth, uh, I didn't intend uh, to speak on this uh, topic uh, for this particular uh, uh, lecture, and, but we discussed it together and it appears that it was the best uh, thing to do. But uh, it's true that uh, this... Uh, uh, lecture is supposed to be my last lecture at the College de France. I pronounced my uh, solemn last lecture in February after the uh, series of the uh, lessons uh, in Paris. But uh, this is the last lecture, but uh, it's a little bit, I confess, that it is a little bit embarrassing for me uh, to think uh, this lecture is the last one for the College de France, both uh, because it is a very weak lecture, because I, uh, I speak English and my English is very poor, and uh, because uh, it is a shame to uh, deliver a lecture in English for the College de France. We try so hard to defend this poor language. Nobody understands it any longer uh, through the world. And I, who am uh, I'm a professor of French literature, I give my last lecture in English. It's, li it's like uh, so a defeat. It's like the... Uh, so. Oh, as capitulate. We are very honoured to have you here, and uh, I think we will uh, close this discussion too, and give you a warm applause. Thank you. I would like to, to add anyway that your conference, your last conference at the Collège de France, is, is on the internet. So it's yes, it is, it is on the on the site, it's yes. a site of the Collège de France, in audio, in video, in video with an English translation, but a good translation, uh, everything. Well, thank you very much. And this uh, will be broadcast this lecture. So we'll Alas, <laughs> I'm terrified. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much.